and say welcome back to your Liberty Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we are actually working hard here in the Piney Woods on what is normally an off day in the Grand Theft World community. It is Monday, June the 3rd, 2024. Uh, but it seems to be, I remember somebody saying that there's uh, no rest for the wicked. And Grand Theft World Liberty Radio definitely falls into that category. Uh, again, depending on who you want to listen to. We, we have our, uh, uh, the people that love us and we have our detractors. Uh, hopefully, AJ is one of the people that loves us because he is joining us in the studio today all the way from the United Kingdom. Uh, and I'm not going to dox your location any more granular than that, AJ. For <laughs> folks in the audience who don't know, AJ is actually the owner and operator of the Open Minds Incorporated Telegram channel, where I steal a fair amount of content for the Liberty Radio Telegram channel from. And I first discovered AJ right around three years ago when he was posting clips of the Grand Theft World podcast when basically nobody else on the planet was, or at least as, as far as we know. So, AJ, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, join us for a little bit today. And uh, I'll, I'll open it up to you. What do you want to let the folks know about Open Minds Incorporated? Wow, okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm surprised actually that you, you jumped on it three three years ago. So uh, about the channel, the reason why I started it is because I, uh, I mean, I knew uh, some of these, this, this stuff, the, the madness going on prior to the, uh, the COVID stuff uh, in 2020. We call it BC, I guess, right? Um, before COVID. Um, yeah, so when when you could say the the um, the alarm was hit on the uh, on the COVID pandemic, um, I realized immediately, like within the first first couple of days, that there was something terribly off, and um, I knew as well that there was going to be an awful lot of people out there that would uh, struggle and they would have their worldview shattered. So. I thought, okay, I need to jump in here. I need to, uh, you know, get into gear, and I need to put information out there that would uh, try and help people uh, make sense of what was going on. So that's why I uh, I started the Open Minds Incorporated channel, and I put incorporated because I believe that everybody needs to incorporate an open mind really in everything that they do, uh, keep their minds open. So uh, that's why it's the incorporated aspect of it. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, but I would say that um, if I want to go a bit further back, what my journey was is I, um, I uh, so I'm originally from Belgium, and I, um, well, my my parents so uh, took me over to South America when I was a kid to Peru, um, because my dad at the time was working for a uh, shipping company, the Belgian shipping company, and he was about to retire. So the Peruvian shipping company had heard of him and asked him, well, you know, they needed help with their uh, shipping lines. So uh, would, would he mind going, you know, go and put in a few more years down there? So that's what he did. So uh, that meant that as a kid, I was speaking English at home because my mother's uh, English and my dad was a Belgian. So I was speaking English at home and then it was French with my dad and it was Spanish at school in Peru. Uh, so so, you know, stayed there for about four years, went back to Belgium, finished my, my studies, so, you know, high school, finished that in Belgium. And then I got myself a job in, uh, in a big sort of uh, financial services bank. Um, and I started with them in January 2008. Uh, so at this point, the, the, the GFC of 2008, the great financial crash, hadn't happened yet. Uh, but I was basically six months into the job when Lehman Brothers had, you know, had collapsed in Bear Stearns. So, you know, so obviously fast, steep learning curve at the time. I think I was about maybe 21, 22. And, uh, it, you know, in the aftermath of that, two years on in the job, 
Uh, I think the inside job came out, and that was you know distributed amongst all the employees in the, in the bank. Not not officially, right? It was just you know a few employees just sharing it. So we had a, as well a bit of a bit more of a, a bigger perspective of what was going on in the banks. And I was a bit I was quite naive at the time, you know, as, as I guess a lot of people are in their early twenties. Um, but I still had I was still very curious at the time, and I think that's because of my upbringing as well. Uh, speaking different languages, you, you, you know, you, you have a, you sort of open your worldview to different cultures and languages. Um, so you then start to open your, your, your mind to different ideas as well uh, and different ways of doing things. So, uh, so anyway, yes, yeah, so I was a bit naive. So what I did in the bank, I started a petition um, because obviously the inside job for me makes such a strong case that the bankers knew this. And at this time, um, I was working in the operations department. Um, so I knew these, these big Wall Street banks. You know, we were a major uh, international sort of clearance bank. So these guys were, were you know, some of them were, were my customers. Um, you know, your JP Morgans and your Goldman Sachs and all those things. So, um, yeah, so then I can carry on my career in there. Um, but the petition didn't lead to anywhere. I mean, I sent it to a few, what, about 20 different employees. Not one of them came back to me. And I generally, generally thought at the time that we were there to improve, you could say, the, the state of the financial uh, world, right? That this would never happen again because, you know, we had all the subprime mortgages and especially in the United States, you then had 10 City and you had the, uh, what was it, the uh, Wall Street uh, occupation movements that was going on as well. So, um, yeah, it was a massive thing. And, you know, I sent this petition around the bank. Nobody replied. So I was thinking, what the hell is going on? Um, so anyway, so I just thought, okay, well, I'll just keep doing my job, right? And several years later, I... Uh, so every year in the financial services uh, um, industry, you have to do a... Um, a multiple choice questionnaire on money laundering or financing terrorism type of thing, right? But after a while, after maybe six years in the job, I was thinking, I'm getting confused with these questions because it depends on which side of the question you sit. Right. On which side, then the answer would be different. So I started failing the, the, this sort of a multiple choice questionnaire. So the only thing that happens when you fail that is you have a one hour training session with an external consultant that's there to talk to you about money laundering and financing terrorism. Uh, so I had to do, you know, one hour of that. But in that uh, one hour session, uh, there may be 20 newcomers to the bank that, uh, you, you know, that's the first time they'd heard about money laundering, I guess, and terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So I just lifted my hand up and I explained one of the reasons why I, why I failed, the, the, the anonymous questionnaire, um, uh, so I just said that, look, as an example, I gave an example that currently in our system, we've got some financial securities that um, are, well, as an example, there was a company in there. It was called, I don't know if they're still around. I haven't looked at them for a while. It was called China North Industries. And I had a bit of time. So I clicked on their website at the time. And their website was, the, or the front page of their website, they had like a, a military helicopter. So I was thinking, okay, an arms manufacturer of some sort. Right. The top right-hand side of the of that website, they had like a little pharmaceutical logo, you know, with the, with the like the, the staff and the snakes or something. So I clicked on that, and it looked like a completely different website that appeared, and they were selling uh, prosthetic legs and, you know, Band-Aids and all sorts of stuff for people that were wounded in, uh, in a war zone. So, so anyway, so I explained this to the external consultant and I said, so, you know, I understand what money laundering is. I understand terrorism, but what do you make of it when our bank uh, allows investments into companies like that that seem to be unethical to my mind? And, um, and she then just, the, the, the external consultant just said, well, you know, she was a bit silenced for, for a couple of seconds. And she just said, well, if it's in our system, it means that it's been approved uh, by the uh, the EU uh, regulatory body and therefore it's business as usual. So that for me was sort of like a, a another awakening moment you could say. Um, so yeah the whole room just went quiet. 
uh, you know, I don't know if those people are still in the bank, but, uh, but anyway, yeah. So I noticed after that that um, some of my responsibilities got taken away from me, although the questionnaire was supposed to be anonymous. I mean, I have a, a suspicion that it obviously wasn't. Um, but yeah, anyway, so then I had the responsibilities taken away from me and uh, I just sort of felt that my time there had come to an end because I didn't want to put my mental health at risk uh, and, or, you know, just sitting there hours upon hours and not doing anything or being in a job I don't want to do anymore. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I just, just, you know, resigned and uh, moved on. Yeah. So, so was, you, you decided not to take the golden handcuffs is what it sounds like, where essentially they're just paying you to keep your mouth shut. You know, while you're still in your in your employ with the uh, the financial company. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily the feeling I had at the time, but obviously in hindsight, you know, I, I realized that they were showing me the door because at the end of the year, again, you have your appraisal or written evaluations, uh, and I remember uh, two positive paragraphs, but sandwiched between the two paragraphs, you have one sentence that said, I still remember to this day, it said, AJ has a strong resistance to stress, but can be perceived as a lack of concern. Right? So, in other words, That's you are very good at managing phrasing. your... Yeah, you're very strong at managing your stress, so it's great because you're not, you're not showing it to other people because stress can be communicated, right? But maybe you don't, you're managing it so well, maybe actually you don't have any stress because you don't care about your job. That's the way... It's meant to be interpreted, I guess, right? So it's like, okay. And that's obviously it's a big sentence to try and show you the door and demotivate you. And yeah. So, yeah. So a bit like um, a bit like Richard Grove's journey where, I mean, he went a step further where he actually became a whistleblower and went to court with uh, uh, his employer. Uh, I, I didn't. You know, I just thought, well, I didn't actually even think about that at the time. But uh, the similarity with Richard Grove's sort of beginning of his journey just like him, I sort of realized, I actually don't understand how the world works at all. Um, if Are we in a meritocracy? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. And they come up with these sort of uh, political sentences to show you the door rather than being open and honest as to why they don't want me to be there anymore. So, um, yeah. yeah mean, so it, anyway, so. It sounds very similar to the experience that I had at Verizon back in was it 2017 or 2018 whatever whatever year it was uh well before the scamdemic came around but i mean i was i was selling everything that wasn't nailed down right because that was my job i was selling handsets i was selling accessories i was selling whatever if it had a price tag and a skew in the system i was trying to sell it i was selling home services i was selling everything that verizon had i was one of their top reps in the region when they decided to serve me with walking papers and i was like wait what what what's going on it it took me a while to put everything together to realize that what had happened was i had pissed somebody off in management with something that i had said about some marketing program that they were trying to run or whatever and at the same time, we had also had some, uh, what should we call them? Well, well, we'll call them DEI hires, right? Because that's exactly what they were. Uh, I later found out that these DEI hires had been working on management behind the scenes uh, to badmouth me in any way that they possibly could in order to get me out the door. So the bottom line came down it was time for me to go because I was an old white man, even though I was producing numbers, producing far more than what these new hires were. It was time to go because I was part of the old guard and the new guard was coming in. And it probably wasn't until maybe 2021 or 2022 that I was able to put all of those pieces together. Because the other thing that I know is uh, all of the other older white males who worked for the company up to the point that, that I was fired had either been removed themselves or had been shuttled into positions where it was basically going to be a dead end for them. 
and they could figure that out on their own or not. You know, it was just, it was up to them. They had been uh, pigeonholed to uh, a place where they weren't going to see the same success that they had had with the company previously. And like I say, it sounds uh, very similar to what you went through with the financial services company. So as, as time went by and you got out of that environment and, and started viewing things differently, like how long did it take you to start putting those pieces together to, to realize, oh, this is what happened? Mm. Um, I wouldn't say too long, maybe a couple of years, maybe two years or something. Um, but I mean, by this time I was probably, so I'm 39 now, but I lived in Australia. I left for Australia from Belgium. I left for Australia when I was about 30. So probably, yeah, during my early days in Australia, I was maybe 31, 32 when I started to realize, ah, okay, there's, you know, something happened there, you know, in my experience. Uh, but also I, I'd, been, I'd been following some of the stuff that was going on uh, at the time as well. Um, I think, um, I, yeah, at the time, I think I, I came across James Corbett. So there was more, you know, you could say uh, pieces of the puzzle that were uh, coming together as I was, you know, turning to the internet a bit more to find out some of the stuff that other people, other people's experience um yeah and of course obviously 9 11 being a big one uh i mean we forget as well that 9 11 was what 23 years ago now mm -hmm. um so you have right now you have a, 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 a young generation that haven't gone through that uh it's now it's, it's up to their parents to tell them about it uh but yeah so i remember i was maybe 16 or 17 when that happened um i remember at the time as well i, I um it was after school hours so at that time i think it would have been uh, well, it's a time, time zone difference, right? There's about five, six hours difference between Belgium and New York. And so, the, yeah, depending remember, on who you ask at the BBC. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. You know, they, they don't account for that 24 minutes. Uh, right, difference, right. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yes, yeah, so I remember walking into my uh, girlfriend's house at the time, and it was after school, so I don't know, it must have been about half past four, five o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I said, oh, what, what, what movie are you watching? She said, I'm not watching a movie, it's the news. I said, oh, wow, okay. And at the time, I think the first tower had come down, but not the second one yet. So I thought, okay, I've got to go home. So I went home, and then by the time I got home, the second tower had come down. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and every year I remember it, although I'm not, I'm not an American. I don't consider myself to be a patriot, I would say, in any sort. Um, I, I still sort of think about it every single year. I've got a calendar with all major events and uh, I've even got a calendar that uh, tells you when Henry Kissinger was born or when he was dead just as a reminder you know so oh nice keep up keep on track on, on side of things yeah. yeah you'll have to send me a link where I can get one of those calendars you know after after okay. we're done yeah. we don't we don't want to yeah. over over flood the servers with uh, with requests while we're <laughs> on the air that's not good I won't be able to get a calendar then and and I won't be happy about that yeah. All right. So I'll they they were actually it, it, this is something that that I'm really curious about. They were actually broadcasting uh, the events that took place in New York City live on the BBC. Uh, correct. So this was Belgium. This was on uh, Belgian channels okay. and and BBC as well. Yes, and BBC they, for, for the whole. Well, as soon as the you could say the first plane struck the uh, struck the tower, or first, you know, it was it was on live for most of the day. I would say, and they kept oh, wow. coming back and forth, you know. But yeah, most of the day, um, yeah. So it's uh, amazing. And I remember going into school the next day, and at the time we already had uh, in Belgium there was already quite a large, uh, you could say, Moroccan community in the school around the, where, where I used to live in the south of Brussels. And, uh, and I remember talking to one of my friends who was a you know Moroccan Muslim, and uh, you know a few of a few of the other kids were saying, "Oh, it's Osama bin Laden, it's, it's Osama bin Laden," and he was the, one of the only ones who was saying, "No, it's not him. It can't be true, and you don't understand and what they've been doing to the Middle East, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And you know we were only like teenagers; we we just didn't understand what he was trying to say. For us, it was oh, the the bearded men from the Middle East—they're they're the bad guys, you know. 
So uh, we pretty much followed the same narrative that was given to, to America, you know, and this was Belgium. So, yeah, very well, much I mean, already... Yeah. It, it does kind of make sense from the standpoint, if you understand the history of the intelligence community, then you know that both the CIA as well as Mossad were set up under the direction of MI6, right? Mm -hmm. So the, all the in, intelligence agencies are essentially incestuous with one another because they're just one big happy family. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that they would be pushing the same narrative in the United States, in the UK, in Belgium, where NATO is headquartered, you know, it, that doesn't surprise me. But it, it does seem to take be, you know, the, the average person by surprise when you point that out to them, right? They're like, what, mm -hmm. what, what are you talking about? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know, I mean, there's, there's a saying that says, what is the oldest job in the world? Right, we know it's prostitution. Correct. That is one of the oldest jobs. And what is the second oldest job in the world? It's intelligence gathering. Right. It's information. And how do you obtain that? You can obtain it through prostitution, obviously. And then you get into your your honey trap scenarios and, and your blackmailing and your Jeffrey Epstein type of stuff. Yeah. So it's you know it, it's how what better way to gather information than from a powerful man than via a woman? Right. Yeah. It's. Um, yeah, so it just seemed logical to me, but uh, yeah, these are these you don't until you stop and think about you know how these things work. If you're just too busy trying to pursue money by your job, and you know you're working nine to five, and then you're exhausted after that, and your kids are you know kids who make you make you want to climb up your walls, and then you just want to sit down and watch some uh, Mr. Beast or you know on YouTube, or you want to watch some uh, reality TV show, I guess. But yeah. So you have to stop for a second and think about what it is that you're, you know, what's this world you're living in, really? Yeah. Well, I think I think that is one of the reasons why the predator class is able to be so successful with their agendas. They they have created this thing called television that allows them to simultaneously distract and program the population to be whatever they want them to be like this is this is a, a hypothesis that i've been working on for quite a number of years at this point but it it seems to me there's a picture in front of me where you have we'll say about we'll say about 30 different personality archetypes in the world right and the whole job of television as well as public education is to make sure that you end up in one of those descriptor boxes, right? And that once you're there, you're, you're not supposed to know that you've been contained in a box with a label on it. And you're also not supposed to know how to, how to you know, climb your way out of it. Or as, as Richard Grove would say, to learn your way out of it. And I think unfortunately what ends up happening is a lot of people just get stuck in that box. They become overwhelmed, even if they recognize that they're inside of a box and they give up because they see that everybody else around them is staying in their boxes and not trying to, to get out of it. So operating under that hypothesis, what was the most difficult thing for you in climbing out of that box? That, that you had been pigeonholed into? Hmm. Wow, okay. Um, to be honest, I don't... Um, I think I remember in my 20s, mid-20s, somewhere around there, I, would, I, I was working in the bank, and then I was just going to work, and, you know, the, the being an automaton, right? Which is what Richard Grove is right. fighting against, to become more autonomous rather than being an automaton. So I guess I was in that cycle for, for a few years. And then I just woke up one day and I said, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I've, I've always been naturally curious. And I felt that I'd stopped asking questions for a couple of years. I'm thinking, why am I doing that? You know, I mean, I should just keep on asking my questions the way I used to be as a teenager or as a kid. Uh, but I just realized that the bank or the way they were operating was, was sort of a bit, uh, you were just doing things for money and you, you know, you were well paid. Uh, you know, you used to like your bonuses and, you know, all these other perks that you had. 
Um, but I just realized, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I think I just decided to embrace that curiosity. And, um, and then you, all of a sudden you realize that when, when you start asking questions, you, you do sort of change a little bit of your, no, actually, you don't change who you are because you've sort of always been that person. But people out on the outside, they start thinking you've changed mm -hmm. because you're now becoming a bit more assertive and you're, you're taking more control of, of you, you know, you're pushing back, you're, you're learning to say no, and you are yeah, taking control of your life. And so then you start to realize how um, some people stick by you and, and they find a bit of courage because you've been speaking out a bit, or some people just walk away. And you might even find new people that want to join with, you know, become your friends. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's not an easy process because you do lose some, some friends or what you, you consider to be friends, um, just because they just want to continue living their life in the, uh, under the smoke screens, you know? Um, so I think that, that could be quite sort of a, it's a social aspect. I think is quite, it's probably the hardest one for me at the time. Yeah. But now, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's, if you choose to be offended by words, that's your choice and that's it, you know, but if you, I, I always think that everybody's got a story to, to, to tell and right. to share. And so, you know, that's their experience and so be it. And if you, if you get offended by somebody else's experience or, or the words that they use, well, that's, that's up to you. Yeah. So well, what would yeah. you, what would you say it was that if it, if there was just one thing that you could point to, that allowed you to finally overcome that that social ostrac ostracization hurdle. Wow, that's a hard hard word to get out of your mouth. <laughs> I won't make you repeat it. No, I won't. Um, it's not some sort of Austrian uh, no, term. No, not even close. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> uh, what is the moment that, that I found that gave me strength, I guess, to try and overcome that? I. Yeah. It's hard to tell. I um, I think sports may have helped me get some strength because I've, I've always been into sports. And what I mean by that is that I found sports obviously to be an anti-stress relief. And it's always, I'm, I'm a tall guy as well. So I guess a bit of confidence sort of came a bit more naturally in, in me. I mean, I'm six foot five. Oh, damn, you're like my height. Right, okay. So I'm a tall guy. I'm probably about, I don't know what it is in in uh, pounds, but I'm about 100 kilos, so I don't know, it's 120 something, I guess, pounds, something, somewhere around there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't know, I just I just think I've found strength from within. It's just, uh, I think it's just about, I mean, how do you gain your, your, your inner strength? I sort of felt that it's about trying to answer the questions that you have. First, go off on your little, you know, have your own little, um, uh, just, just go along your your path your, along your path for for a while on your own, and don't don't have to tell everybody all the time, you know. But just go off on your little path until you gain sufficient information, and that would then, you know, if you have a bit more knowledge, you can then, as the you know the classical trivium would suggest, you can first gain knowledge, and then you can gain understanding of that knowledge, and once you've got the understanding of that knowledge, you can then. Um, pass that on and be able to communicate it in a in a, in a, in a, in a well enough manner that people will understand you and that constitutes like the, the wisdom of it. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the, the thing I've done naturally to be honest. I, but I mean it was a longer process but once I heard of the trivium it made it a lot easier because it's more of a systematic approach of figuring out what's what's uh, you know the, the logical aspect the truth and fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has seemed to serve <clears throat> quite a few people quite well over the the millennia, you know, because it's uh, it's a system that has been around for a long, long time. It was just hidden from most people's view, uh, beginning you know back at the beginning of the twentieth century when the the Prussian education system was exported to most of the developed world so that they could create nice little interchangeable humans for the economy that they were building at that time. Right. Or at least that's, that's what I've gotten from the history. I don't know. You might've gotten something a little bit different. Um, well, if you want to delve into the, the Belgian schooling system, um, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I think I spoke about this with uh, somebody that you, uh, I'm sure you know, or you've heard of at least uh, Justin Olson. I mean, I think oh yeah. Yeah. 
contributor with the you know the G, within the GTW community, and uh, yeah, so we spoke about a bit about education and some of the differences. Uh, but to be honest, it didn't seem to be that different. Uh, but he is twelve years younger than I am, so uh, I remember we weren't allowed to use calculators at the time in high school. But eventually we were. But at that time we were probably. 16, 17 when we were able to use them. But prior to that, we weren't. Uh, it's obviously, you know, for, for all the listeners out there, it's prior to uh, smartphones, mm -hmm. prior to computers uh, being in the schools. Um, so yeah, we had all the, the, the chalkboards, we had the alphabet at the top of the, the, the board with your ABCs. And uh, yeah, the good old fashioned way, you know, you had your, the school bell that would ring in the in the playground and you all had to line up uh, you know, behind the white line in ranks side by side and hold hands and you know, a bit more like a prison system as I'm sure you, you know, you've probably experienced something similar. Oh yeah. Uh, and the teachers used to throw us chalk or you know, when we weren't listening or they actually even went further some of them. They used to throw us the, the actual wooden eraser, they used to throw it at us. Yeah, and, and I can actually even tell you another story if you want. This was so this was around nineteen, I don't know, eighty, probably eighty six, eighty seven. Actually, no, a bit later than that. Like nineteen ninety, let's say. So um, I was about six years old, and we were learning the the alphabet. A, you know, uh, the the teacher had this massive one meter wooden ruler to point at the top of the uh, of the chalkboard to, to you know to point to the letters, and she would say, you know, we would follow her A B C D. And at one point, I'm sitting at the back of the classroom and I hear the, the, the piano. So we had a, a piano at the back of the classroom that wasn't being used anymore. And it was the, the kid that was supposed to be sitting next to me. He actually just got up off his chair and started playing the piano. Just random keys, right? So the, obviously the teacher wasn't very happy about that. And she basically threatened him. She said, Sit, you know, go back to your seat or I'll, uh, I'll tie you to your seat. So he went back to his seat and we, you know, we... Uh, went back to the alphabet, A, B, start from top, you know, A, B, C, D. And then you hear the piano again. So this kid has got up again, played the piano. Sounds like my cat. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then, um, yeah, and the next thing you know, the teacher opens up her, uh, her drawer from her, her desk, and she's got one of these massive uh, ropes that, you know, in, I mean, to me, it looked massive at the time. It was a proper rope. She got it from her drawer, from her desk, and then she just tied this kid to his chair. And she got one of these, you know, these big brown um, adhesive uh, things that you put on cardboard boxes to seal cardboard boxes, sticky tape. She put one of those across his mouth. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, next thing you know is this kid's no longer in the school. Like he's he's left. Never saw him again. So uh, yeah. So I don't know, obviously his parents took him out of school, and but the teacher was still there, you know, she was fine. I'm guessing she got away with it. And, uh, well, it sounds yeah. like she got away with it, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. the way the way that system worked when I was in school, uh, and I'm about uh, 10 years your senior, I'm, I'm just too shy to give my actual age at this point because I'm pushing five decades. But um, it was very similar. It was very, very similar. I remember being on the business end of punishment from teachers, administrators, so on and so forth for literally doing nothing more than asking questions, right? For, for pointing out the, the fallacies in their logic, even, even at a young age. Like I was listening to what they were saying. I'm like, wait a minute, that you said this, but then said this immediately afterward. And those two things contradict one another. What, what's going on here? Uh, and obviously that never went over very well. Uh, I never got kicked out of school. I got, I got detention a bunch. I got suspended a bunch of times, uh, but I never got kicked out. But I remember some of my friends who found themselves in the same situation did. And I specifically remember that the terminology that was used when they were being removed from the public school was they were invited to leave. <laughs> and Please leave. yeah right and Please like leave. i was always like well what if you just don't accept the invitation mm. yeah well there you go i mean this is some of the i mean you just reminded me there of during the during the the covid pandemic thing you know we had we had police officers in the streets so uh, 
so long story short is that so I, I, uh, I then went over from Belgium, I went to Australia, right, for like four, yeah, four years. And then I came over to the UK. I'm, I'm in the northwest of UK on the outskirts of a city called uh, Chester, which is northwest England, which is about half an hour, 40 minutes drive from Liverpool. Okay. And it's on the Welsh border, right, pretty much on the Welsh border. So we had different rules for COVID in Wales, but also different rules in England. And with regards to your invitation, I remember, um, you know, police officers or, you know, not just them, but also uh, employees in supermarkets saying, please wear a mask. It's the law. You will hang on. It, you know, is it a request? Can I deny? You've, you've you said, please, you know, and I think that, that might just speak to the British politeness where the, they feel awkward to, to ask, to order you around. So they just say, please. But the Nazis did the same, didn't they? You know, papers, please. Yeah. Well, I, I had the uh, great displeasure to have to uh, interact with uh, somebody in another one of my former employment fields, that being insurance, a couple of days ago. And uh, at the very beginning of the conversation, something that this person said really jumped out at me. And I bit my tongue at the time. I probably shouldn't have. Uh, but they said, I'm just following the protocols here. And it, 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 as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, so you're a Nazi. Okay, well, at least I know who I'm dealing with. Yeah, 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 exactly. We, we even had COVID marshals. So they, they, I mean, I didn't see many, but there were, I think it must have been on a, on a council level, or it might have been a governmental level, but they were handing out uh, sort of like fluorescent, fluorescent uh, high-vis jackets. We had COVID marshal on the back, right? And they were like walking around the streets. Uh, they didn't have any guns or any, you know, cowboy hats on, you know, not, not nothing like, like you know, like Texas, I guess, but uh, they, it's the north northwest of England. You don't have cowboy hats here, but they were just walking around the towns. And I guess what were they doing? I don't know. But they were just civilians. They weren't. They weren't law enforcement. They weren't police or anything. They just there, I guess, to ask people to please socially distance. I guess I, I don't know. Right. Well, like, did they even have the power to like? You know, if somebody was only five feet away from somebody else, could they like write them a ticket or anything like that? No, not even. And by the way, it was two meters here. Oh, two that's meters. right. That's right. I'm sorry. You, it's, you guys, it's, yeah, it's, you're it's, on metric. We're no. still imperial oh. here in the United States. I, I apologize. Well, we, we are, we are, um, uh, we are also imperial here in, in, in the UK, but sometimes they've still got two different systems. And I think it's partly because they're trying to, prepared to join the EU or to make it easier, I guess, for trade. So on certain articles, they'll have uh, things measured in grams and kilos. Um, but then when it comes to uh, distance, they'll use feet and miles. But here, for some reason, during the pandemic, they put two meters. They, want, they went back to the metric system for some reason. They put two meters. But two meters is not six feet, which is what it was in the United States, right? Right. It's two meters is actually more than six feet. It's about six feet, I don't know, six feet, six, six feet, seven, somewhere around there. So it's, you know, who makes up these things? And speaking of which, I think I saw that uh, Fauci, uh, Fauci's interview or the transcripts were, were released by the Republicans yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. where he sort of uh, basically says that he, he just made it up or he does, he's not quite sure where he got the six feet from. Right. Or whether or not you should have a mask on if you're, a, I don't know, a child or, yeah. Well, I thought, so I thought that was, uh, that release was actually rather interesting timing since it came yesterday, which was the final day of the Bilderberg meeting in Madrid for 2024. And it also just so happened, complete coincidence, they didn't set it up this way or anything, I'm sure that Donald Trump's conviction in his hush money trial was on the first day of the Bilderberg meetings. Again, just total coincidence. You know, these things happen. It's just very interesting. Yep. It's interesting time. It, it is very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into that. I mean, I know it's all over the internet right now with uh, you know, the, the hush money and uh, was it 34 charges uh, or some sort of felony, but, 
but actually it isn't a felony it's just a uh, a, a mistake in, in you know the way the, the way he sort of labeled the hush money because hush paying somebody hush money apparently in the united states is not illegal yeah. uh, as long as it's not covering up a crime i guess um but uh yeah so it's just all obviously trumped up uh, again <laughs> so it's it's yeah, it, it, is, it is sad. And I, and I remember talking to somebody as well months ago, this was last year at least, um, when they when they said they were going to try, and, and, and I'm guessing with regards to uh, uh, to the Stormy Daniels thing, um, but I remember saying to somebody, imagine if they did take him to trial, and to court, and then sent him to jail. His strong his supporters, I'm guessing, I don't know, they probably wouldn't take it for a second time, you know, because they'd consider that probably as election meddling again. But even if they announce that they that they they go to court and he doesn't get sent to jail, what is the the radical left going to think about that? Are they going to potentially go back into the streets? But then there's a the third sort of scenario. I was thinking, well, you might find that that's just sort of uh, extreme groups, and they might not be the majority of the people. But I do know that obviously in the United States, it's very uh, the election is very very tribal. So I don't know. I mean, I sort of feel, is there going to be more of a docile um, citizenship that's not going to do anything no matter what uh, happens? Or is it going to be in pockets in certain states? Um, was there only going to be a, like a, a dispute within um, contested states where it might be 50-50 in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Democrats versus Republicans? Is there going to be more uh, riots or summers of love in those type of cities? <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's it's an interesting scenario to ponder um, because I was of the opinion back in 2020, I expected riots at uh, the end of, of that election, right? When they, when they finally came out and said, Joe Biden is the victor, he's going to be the next president, yada, yada, so on and so forth. I expected that there was going to be a lot more action in the streets than there was. And now we've had almost another entire four years of those people who, yeah, some of them were there on January 6th and they ended up in a cage as a result. You know, that's uh, grown adults make their own decisions, folks. That's just the way it is. If they didn't realize that the state was going to crack down on them, that's on them. That's not on anybody else. It's not, as far as I'm concerned, that's not even on the state. You should expect at this point that the state wants to put its boot on you. Don't give them a reason. But we didn't see that. Even on January 6th, we didn't really see that, right? It was still very orderly. Uh, people weren't really in the capital, like with the intent of destruction, some of them were, sure. But it was a very small minority. The vast majority of people that were there were there because they wanted to make their voices heard. They weren't trying to overthrow the government or any of this other garbage nonsense that the mainstream media has been trying to put forth for the last four years. But we've also had four years now where the, that frustration that was created as a result of that election has been boiling beneath the surface along with all of the other provocations that have been heaped on top of it. So I don't know. I honestly don't know uh, what type of behavior this latest round of developments is going to provoke. Uh, and there's a part of me that is extremely concerned that this is what is going to be used to provoke the general public into violence in the streets, which they've been trying to do for years now and have been summarily unsuccessful at this point. But this is finally the leverage that the predator class has been trying to get that is going to allow them to send the stormtroopers in, start rounding up the Patriots, start collecting the guns, start doing all of that stuff, whether it's under the auspices of the Democrats or the Republicans, I don't think matters a bit. The only thing that matters is getting the weapons out of the hands of the general public in the United States. 
And I think I think that's the direction that everybody is being herded in with the conviction and whatever else is going to come of it. Mm. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm completely yeah. off base on that. And I, I'm wondering as well if there's a if the um, I mean if you go go back maybe prior to the the age of social media and maybe even prior to the internet, if there was something like this to to happen, I'm just thinking maybe there would have been a riot by now or, or a, you know, more of a civil war type of scenario. But I'm wondering if uh, people on both sides of the aisle, I mean the people, not, not the political parties, but I'm wondering if the, the, whether you, you consider yourself a Democrat or Republican, I wonder if, if those people also know that there's a third player, here, which is the government, this nebulous idea that if they misbehave, the government and the military or the National Guard or whoever it is will come crashing down on them. So maybe there is more of a, uh, a an awareness of that uh, because they also know that the government has misbehaved. And I'm sure both sides know this, that, you know, whether it's the weapons of mass destruction, uh, lies or uh, any of these things with regards to, I don't know, even today with regards to Palestine and Israel or yeah. uh, Vietnam, all these things, I think enough there's enough consciousness or you know enough knowledge around even if they don't understand it all i think there's enough knowledge around in the people to understand that the government will come after you if you misbehave so i'm, I'm just guessing maybe people are behaving because of that fear maybe and so it sort of cancels itself out and nothing is going to happen um who knows i mean that's who knows? that seems to be the most likely scenario because that's that's typically what happens. Like, look at the the protests that were taking place on college campuses within the last few weeks. And again, I know that those are all manufactured and none of them are genuine, even though the kids that were duped into attending those protests, they believe that it's all genuine, right? The state did not hesitate a second to go in and start cracking skulls. Matter of fact, they were frothing at the mouth to be able to go and do that. And that's no different than what it was back in the 1960s when the anti-war protest movement was going on. It is exactly the same. And we know from decades of research that have been done since that time that all of that was engineered as well. So I think you could be right. You know, I think it could just be a case of you know, the government cracks down every now and then to let everybody know on live national television that they're the ones in control, they're the ones in charge, and if you get out of hand, they will not hesitate to show you. I, mm. I think that's exactly it, which is, again, what leads me to, to think that this is all in service of being able to essentially reduce American Second Amendment rights to dust at this point. Mm. You know, we're, we're, too, uh, we're too angry, we're too worked up, we're too deluded to, to be able to uh, uh, lawfully and, and legally own firearms anymore. So we have to be disarmed. And again, mm. I, don't, I don't subscribe to the theory that it's going to be the United States federal government that's going to be doing that disarming. I think if anything, the federal government is actually going to step back and just let it happen so that then we can have, I don't know, NATO come in and do the enforcement. They already own the, the Norfolk Naval Base, one of the largest bases in the world, period. Doesn't matter what branch of the military you're talking about. That's already NATO property has been for three years now. NATO already has their foothold in the United States as a military force. So as yeah. far as I can tell, they're just waiting for the right moment to start rolling the troops out. And at that point, it's going to be all over. Hmm. It, when I was just listening then, listening to you talk, they reminded me of uh, in the 1960s, as you know, you know, there was, there was the whole uh, counterculture movement and all that. And um uh, it was, I mean, in my calendar here, I've got every 4th of May, and that, you know, uh, 4th of May is a nice uh, day to remember, or easy to remember, really, but 4th of May 1970 is when you had your your shootings uh, by the National Guardsmen, and uh, I think they were higher National Guardsmen that shot uh, 
what was it here? Um, I've got a couple of students here that, that actually died, nine students and murdering four. So wounding nine students, murdering four at Kent State University. Um, yeah, that's for uh, protesting too much against uh, against the war, I guess. Uh, but that also reminds me to reminds me about uh, the uh, I think it was the Trilateral Commission that came out with one of their first um, first reports a few years later called the the Crisis of Democracy, uh, where they were basically looking back in the, at the 1960s and they were suggesting that there was an, an excess of democracy in the United States, and so this sort of that that. Well, I, mean, I remember reading it years ago, but um, that was one of the another nudge, I guess, for for my awakening. Where I was thinking, okay, an excess of democracy. So, in other words, the I sort of see democracy or this smokescreen of democracy as a pressure valve that you can tighten the screws on a bit if you if you have too much freedom, too much liberty, too much expression. And the day that you haven't got uh, enough of it, and you're feeling that people are, are need to express themselves, otherwise, uh, you know, it becomes a question of national security where they could potentially overthrow the government. They would then potentially, strategically, allow you to protest, allow you to express yourself, allow you to have punk rock music, you know, with your your Sex Pistols and your Johnny Rotten that had a few songs of his cancelled back in the day. But uh, but yeah, so it just reminds me, and some of the parallels today potentially is somewhat similar, I think. Maybe I'm mistaken, but um, where we do have all this freedom to walk around naked and uh, Pride Month, um, I don't know how much more freedom you want uh, to be a degenerate. Right. Um, right. That's what we come down to. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can have all the freedom you want as long as you're providing the exactly wrong type of role model for people, right? You start you start doing things like exposing the truth, exposing the malfeasance in the system, exposing all the ways that the system is rigged against the individual. That's when you start getting the hammer. Or at least again, that's been my experience and and what my research seems to have shown. But it doesn't Again, it doesn't surprise me from the the standpoint of I have read the works of people like Aldous Huxley and H.G. Wells, and I know that you have as well. And there does appear to be a very clear blueprint that was laid down many, many years ago to get us from point A, which is a... Uh, you know, uh, basically a free world, people allowed to decide their, you know, the course of their lives for themselves. That's point A. Point B is one world government top-down control. You have to ask the state for permission to breathe when you wake up in the morning. And it's, again, this, this plan seems to have been slowly rolling out over the decades uh, and and nobody seems to be the wiser as far as the general public is concerned, because, again, measures have been taken to ensure that the general public is not presented with this information too often. So at, at what point in your journey did you uh, encounter the agenda for world government and like what did that do to your worldview? Mm. Well, so huh, I must have encountered the the first time I maybe came across the idea of a world government. I mean, I'm guessing it must have been in the cartoons of the 1980s. I mean, I used to watch G.I. Joe, American cartoons that were shown on the, on some of the uh, the French and Belgian uh, uh, TV channels. So we had a lot of um, so in France particularly they had the, the, the cartoons they were showing were more of the Japanese uh, anime type of cartoons, but they also had an influx of American cartoons that were coming in uh, also on British TV. But not I, I didn't I mean in Belgium I only had BBC One and BBC Two uh, that were that still is to this day shown in Belgium. But on the Belgian TV channels that either take the French or at least in the southern part of Belgium they, where they speak French. And in the north part, they speak Flemish or, or Dutch. But on the French-speaking channels, they would take from, from France. And they had, you know, your G.I. Joes and your Thundercats and all these other things. So I'm guessing I must have 
come across the idea of world government at a very young age in one of these evil, you know, very black and white cartoons, I would say. Um, but then, you know, you then sort of forget a bit about that and then you, you just carry on in your life. And I think the first time I probably came across it, like in writing, was uh, when I was looking a little bit more into the uh, United Nations. And I came across James Warburg, who in the 19, when was it, 1948, somewhere around there? Uh, I've got it here, I'll, I'll bring it up so I can give you the exact, uh, um, the exact quote. So it was actually in the 1950, so, um, in the United States, um, they had, uh, this was in the Senate, I believe, uh, they were looking at um, a um, at reforming or revising the United Nations Charter in 1950. Uh, and the UN was established in 1945, so five years before. But James Warburg was uh, there in front of, there's a transcript, there's a, actually a whole Wikipedia page about it, if people believe in Wikipedia. Uh, but there was a transcript on Wikipedia, and James War Warburg is quoted saying, we shall have world government whether or not we like it. The question is only whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. So I think that is a very chilling uh, sentence to me. Um, and I didn't know at the time who, who he was. I didn't, I didn't, didn't have an idea, no, no clue whatsoever. Well, yeah, he was related start. to uh, Paul and Felix, wasn't he? Well, Paul. So James Warburg was his, was Paul's son, ah. correct? So Paul Warburg was his was his father, and Felix, who was in, in Germany, he was the uh, his uncle. Yes. So then you then start, uh, and I started uh, looking a bit more into him, and obviously then I fell on uh, G. Edward Griffin and the uh, the creature of Jekyll Island, with the Federal Reserve. Um, and then, yeah, and then I thought, okay, I, I wanted at the time when I came across that, I thought I need to write a book about the uh, um, central banks because that was sort of my, my field, I guess. But then what happens is when you start re researching central banks, I just picked one to start off with. I thought, okay, I'll pick the Bank of England. What's its history? What's its origin? And it's lo and behold, it's on their website. The Bank of England have got like a whole history section on their website with pictures from the from their vault of original documents of what they used to be and um from what i from what i remember in my research years ago they were first established as a corporation to fund the british empire's navy so it wasn't a, a government owned at all it was basically the, the crown didn't have enough money to fund the navy so there was a bunch of uh British aristocrats and, and noblemen that uh, you know put all money into the same box and had shares to in order to build a navy. So then you realize this, you go, okay, that's interesting. So it's private people, private families that start establishing this corporation called the Bank of England. And by the way, the from what I remember again in my research is the the British government, which potentially is another corporation, I guess, right? a bunch of managers. But they uh, purchased or they, they reimbursed the, the shareholders only after World War II. Uh, so now it is like 100%, so they say 100% owned by the government. But when you look into it, it is not really the government per se. It is actually one department within the government, which is only like five people within that department that actually are the main shareholders of the Bank of England. Um, so then it prompted me also to look into how they how they try, how they do things. And they just print the notes, they just print the money, just like the Federal Reserve. But in the UK, you have the Royal Mint, and the Royal Mint, they mint the coins. They don't touch the notes, they just mint the coins. And not just for the UK, but for something like 100 different countries, they mint all their coins. Um, so then that leads me to a question where then I sent them an email, and I said, well, how do these company how do these countries pay for your services do they pay you in you know british pounds that they have already in coins or do they pay you in their local currency uh, and by the way how do you pay yourselves as as this this institutional corporation that manufactures money um you know do you just turn on the printer or turn on the the minting machine at the end of every month and fill your pockets 
or how does it work? You know, um, because if you've got obviously, if you own the the printer as the Bank of England does, I would th I would have thought, well, I'm guessing they just turn on the printer at the end of the month and fill their pockets. But apparently, it doesn't work that way. Apparently, it's the government or this little department within the government that allows them a certain amount of salary to be paid, which I guess this also leads me to my next question, which I've been thinking about for years. Why is it that every central bank has a target rate of 2% for the inflation rate? Why do they want 2% inflation? Yeah, why is that the magic Maybe, number? Why is that the magic number? Why not 1? Why not 10? You know, And I, I still don't know exactly why, but uh, if you look into the ac actual definition of inflation, it was actually, coincidentally, changed in 1971 which was the same year they went off the gold standard in the united states right but the definition of inflation if you think about it again what what inflates inflation is not prices don't inflate price prices don't blow up or, or you know or get deflated what what inflates is the is the money supply mm -hmm. it's like a bubble so Inflation actually means expansion of the money supply. And that used to be the, if you pick up a dictionary prior to 1971, the definition used to be expansion of the money supply. And who's in charge of expanding the money supply? The central banks. And you can point your fingers at them automatically, like straight away if you have that definition. But here now, since 1971, everybody has the understanding that inflation means increase in prices. No, that's the consequence of the expansion of the money supply. So now all of a sudden you're not pointing your finger at the central bank, you're pointing it at the local shop. You're pointing it at the, the small employee, the franchisee for Shell. I mean, he doesn't make much money at the petrol pump. You know, he's, he just takes a cut, but the, you know, he's, he's not in charge of increasing prices because of so-called inflation. And, you know, it's all monetary policy. So then that made me, when I got down into that research about central banks and, you know, came across G. Edward Griffin, I was thinking, wow, okay, now I'm getting into not just banks, but I'm, I'm getting into general history territory where it's about wealthy families. And who are these families, by the way? Oh, we've got names like such as Rothschilds that keep popping up over and over again. So now all of a sudden, yeah, I'm thinking, well, I need to do more research on what, you know, what these people do. And then obviously James Corbett and Richard Grove and all that sort of helped me along the way as well. Uh, so then I, yeah, I uh, stopped start purchasing an awful lot of books and I still have an awful lot of them that I haven't uh, opened up yet because I'm, you know, they're all piled up waiting to be read. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a minefield and if you start going down the path of history, you're then touching upon geopolitics and, uh, you know, resources and then you get across, you know, to, to, to full loop, full circle. Uh, we started this conversation by talking about intelligence operations and you know it, you get you get across those type of things and how the the concept of government and, and what is a nation you know the language of a what is a nation or what is a country it's this sort of nebulous and nebulous thing that you can't put your finger on it, it's it's almost as if it's just it's purely just a um a name on a map that if you cross this line that's not yours that's mine and this side of the line is mine the other side is yours but obviously, the concept of a nation is is more than that. There's culture in there. You know, there's all sorts of other things as well. But it's it is really a, a. I sort of see nations as just another one of those things, which is left versus right, which are they just they just groups. Um, but then you then get into philosophical questions. If these are just groups, then you get into the philosophy aspect, which is. What are we doing on this planet? You know, we're we just wandering around and trying to figure things out. But you realize that some people are not trying to figure things out. They're trying to control other people. Um, because if we realize that as per the American Constitution, which says that we are uh, all the same, basically, beneath, beneath God, you know, we all have equal rights. What's the, what's the word? Inalienable rights under, under God, right? So... But obviously, there's clearly some, a group of people that uh, don't believe in that, and they, they obviously use all these smoke screens to prevent you from figuring that out. Well, yeah, that's why I think Animal Farm should always have been included as an addendum uh, to the United States Constitution, because George Orwell clearly states in that book that all animals are equal. 
but some are more equal than others. And that is exactly the system that we have all been living under since, uh, since birth. You know, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how far back it actually goes. Because it, mm. it, it, again, it seems to me like the, the system of oppression that we all live under in the Western world is something that has been refined over a very large number of centuries. Like you, I can see parallels back to the Roman and Greek empires in terms of how uh, governance is carried out upon the population. And it seems like every time there was a peasant's revolt, they learned from their mistakes and they became much more efficient at dishing out their governance, you know, as, as time went by up until we got to the great experiment of the United States. And then you have, again, all the Western nations around the world mimicking and even many of the undeveloped nations mimicking what the United States did in the 1770s. And, you know, again, the legitimacy of, of even that is up for question at this point, as far as I'm concerned. But to get back to the monetary issue, which is, again, one of the main leverage points that is used over every single person every single day, uh, we have this new economy emerging over the course of the last 10 years or so, right? The crypto economy, thanks to, to Bitcoin and to a lesser extent, Ethereum and all the other coins. What being someone that has worked in the financial services industry and has done a lot of research into uh, economics and money and how all of that works, what is your opinion of the crypto economy? Well, uh, I remember years ago when Bitcoin sort of uh, came out, I remember whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is or was, I mean, you know, you can debate that all day long, probably. Um, but the, the, I could say that the original intention, from my understanding, is that it was never meant to be pegged or given a value in dollars. It was supposed to be completely separate from any current monetary or economic system. Uh, but that obviously became very quickly hijacked. And I, if I remember, there was some sort of conference, I can't remember what it was, but uh, I think JP Morgan was even invited to the table to have a discussion about Bitcoin. And then, then these big guys decided that, okay, we're not going to give it an equivalent in US dollars. So right there, I think there's a, there's a problem right there with all the crypto, because it just seems to me that it's it's... The, the, the initial intention of the purpose behind it, for me, it seems that it was uh, a noble purpose, I could say, maybe, um, where it was trying to detach itself from the, the, the control system or the current status quo. But it's now, obviously, since they've decided to, to give it a, a, a US dollar uh, equivalent, it's now become, it, the people get into crypto because they see that it's got a US dollar equivalent. They may not think that, but I, I, I think that subconsciously they are looking at Bitcoin or all these other cryptocurrencies and looking at the equivalent in US dollars that they can get out of it. And they go, oh, great. Now, you know, what was it? I think Bitcoin, I think today I saw a post to say or a tweet or whatever to say it's $70,000 today, Bitcoin. And why, why, are, why is there such a hype to, to give the equivalent in US dollars if you are... Uh, trying to get away from the status quo and from the, the old banking dynasties, right? So I think uh, the, the, since day one, as soon as it, or at least as, as soon as it was, it, it was given an equivalent where you can purchase these cryptocurrencies, the digital assets, as they call them, I guess, uh, I think that's been already, that there's, there's, there's a problem right there. Um, and, and I think there's even a problem within money itself. I think there's a... Um, that there's a, a a value problem where you can't include you, you cannot include um, a, a social element as such to 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 money, and, and I'll probably get around to that a bit a bit later. But the way I if I try and pick apart what money is, uh, or what at least what currency is, the simplest 
way I can sort of uh, explain it, it would be um, that it is a, a translation or mathematical, in, in, in use, but no, sorry, it, it is a translation of the energy of your labor using the language of mathematics. So you give it that and because you can, you can measure it, right? But you can't really, you can't really measure your energy as such. So you have to agree that whatever amount of time and effort you've put into something, into making something, that you will get, let's say, one hundred dollars. Um, but so within that, it, it's it is not um, it, it's nothing else. I don't, I don't think. Well, and again, if you want to look back at other ways of extracting the energy of your labour. I mean, they had slavery back in the day. They didn't have to measure it as such, or maybe they did measure it through head counts or you know the number of slaves that they had. Um, but that's another way of extracting the energy of your labor. Now, today, with regards to the digital aspect, they they are harvesting your data, and that is, in a way, is harvesting the the, the energy or at least the attention you're giving to something online, and and they measure it with data. So that, in a way, it is a currency when they extract the data and your biometrics, which of your attention, which you willfully give give to them, really, um, and then they then translate that into U.S. dollars, for example, once they've gathered all that data. Um, but so, but again, I, I I'm more of a real world type of person, so if I can't touch it, I just see these uh, digital coins or digital currencies, I just see them as, in a way, being a bit of entrapment again, because in order to, to get your hands, so to speak, on some of these digital currencies, you need at least three different tools. And those tools are some sort of technological equipment that is made by some corporation, right, that is going to want to be paid in whatever they want to be paid in, which you're going to have to get your hands on. And the next uh, tool that you have to get your hands on. Well, it's the energy that's gonna that's gonna power up that that uh, technological tool, the, or the, the the material, the hard the hardware, and that energy company is gonna want to be paid in the currency that they want to be paid. And on top of that, you need your communication corporation that's gonna want to be paid as well. So that right there, there's the intersection uh, of three different corporations that will want you want you to pay them in whatever they see fit before you can actually get your hands on on this digital currency, whether it's crypto or you know CBDC or all these other things. So that, that's my view on it, and it's nothing that is tangible, and therefore I, don't, I do not have any control over it. And I, I mean, I'm sorry for, for people that get offended by this, but I just see it as a, a bunch of pixels uh, you know, trapped in a, in a screen somewhere, whether it's on your smartphone or your computer. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, but, I mean, like I can I can wrap my head around the store of value argument, right? Because if we're if we're trying to compare Bitcoin to real world assets, in order to you know make a useful analogy, then gold would be the obvious analog in the real world, right? Because there's a finite supply of it, as far as we know. I mean, there could be, they could pull down, you know, asteroids that have $3 trillion worth of gold they can mine from it, sure. But as far as what's on the planet, all that's here is all that's ever going to be here, as far as, as we can tell. Um, and that's the same thing with, with Bitcoin. So, obviously, that's why gold became a popular store of value, and Bitcoin can be that digital analog as well. As far as being an actual currency that people can use every day to transact with one another. I, I don't see that, that Bitcoin was ever meant to serve that purpose because of its limited nature. Again, with fiat currencies, we can print as much or as little as we need to get the job done. And then if there's too much in circulation, we can just take it out, right? We, we can destroy it, we can burn it, whatever. We can get rid of it until such time as we need it again, and then we can just print more. You know, which, depending on on how deep you are into the crypto world, there's plenty of coins or tokens that that fill that void. What I see it as is getting people conditioned to the idea 
that you no longer need to walk around with physical pieces of paper in your pocket in order to transact value with other human beings, which is the system that we've had for however many years. Who knows at this point? It's anybody's guess. They're basically just taking it and transitioning that from the physical world to the digital world so that there can be a greater level of control over how it's made, what its value is, how it gets transacted, who it gets transacted with, who's allowed to have it, and maybe more importantly, who isn't allowed to have it. I mean, to me, it's, it's just a natural progression of the same control system that we've always had. It's just now forcing you into a much tighter corral than, than what we've been used to. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, perfect. It does make sense. Yeah, it does. And, and it's at the end of the day, it is a belief system. And uh, I mean, there's been many belief systems over, over the centuries. I mean, I've... I've just remembered one as well with regards to storage of value. Uh, there's some, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's one storage of value, which is called the Rye Stones. So it's spelled R-A-I. And it's, um, they actually are just basically uh, uh, stones that are carved. And some of them are like, you know, eight feet uh, in height. And they are off the shore in, well, they're in Micronesia, basically, in the Yap Islands. And uh, they've been going for thousands of years. And, and um, the what I remember from, from it when looking into it is that the, the locals, they were looking for some sort of currency and uh, they came up with these stones and they, they had these huge stones. But everybody, and this is where I'm getting to, is with, with regards to honesty. In these some small islands, there was honesty. The, the, you know, everybody sort of knew each other. And they all knew that the stone in the center of the village belonged to a certain family. And that whenever they wanted to purchase something from somebody else, they just basically all told each other that that uh, stone now belonged to the next family. Um, but so they all, they all knew that, that they all had their own sort of stones. Um, but then at one point, I remember that they, they had to go to a, a, a neighboring island and they were trying to bring back some of these stones. And... Um, you know, if, if, if any of these stones were to fall overboard from a, a small boat that they had, uh, well, you know, they'd just go back to the village and say, well, actually, we tried to bring the stone with us, but it actually fell overboard, so your stone is at the bottom of the ocean. So they just took it on, on, on face value, or, you know, just because it was it's based off honesty, right? So I think it's the same today. If, if there isn't honesty behind... The, the people that control the money or that or the, that start a currency or or you know if there isn't a, an honest an honest and an, and a belief system as well then it's not going to really going to work so as long as people believe in in the currencies it's just going to keep on going until they struggle too much and then they have to get wheelbarrows out to to buy a loaf of bread um, but unfortunately, it should be people should be up in arms about it before they get to that point. They should be proactive uh, and demand certain things from from their local representative if they still believe in the political system that is as well, right? So there's a whole social aspect to to it. Uh, if if one of them's not working, then the west the, the rest of the system starts to to crumble as well. And the system is only as good as the people that that are there to. Uh, uh, to control it, I guess, or to, to make sure that it's honest and that it's working. Well, and <clears throat> you make an excellent point as well, because the system is only as strong as the belief that is fed into it by the participants, right? And I mean, there's, there's no uh, probably clearer example of that than the Great Depression in the United States, when everyone was manipulated into bank runs on the major financial institutions in the United States, people went to withdraw their money and they collapsed because the withdrawing of the money represented them removing their belief from the system. They no, they no longer believed that their money was safe in the bank. So you're, you're absolutely correct in that it is all underpinned by belief. And that goes for government too. If people remove their belief from the government, the power of the government diminishes. 
Now, that doesn't mean that they automatically lose their rifles and their tanks and their F-16s. But if nobody is there to point that gun, if nobody is there to drive that tank, if nobody is there to pilot that jet fighter, what good is it? And, and that's what I'm always talking about when I talk about removing your power from the system. Reclaim your belief from the system. And if everybody does that, or at least a majority of the people do that, the system will collapse because it cannot function without that belief. So I'm 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 very glad that you seem to to be, you know, uh, thinking along the same lines uh, as far as that goes with belief underpinning pretty much everything that we do in society. Without that belief, there there's nothing there. It just doesn't happen. Um, now I've already uh, I've already had you for about 80 minutes now. Uh, which I, I know in our correspondence, I said, you know, probably about an hour or so, depending on, uh, you know, how things go. Everybody's different when it comes to the interviews. So I always try to uh, to honor that. And I'm definitely not going to try to monopolize your time because it's a Monday and I know how those usually go. Um, but one thing that I did want to ask you uh, before I release you back to your regularly scheduled life, because I see the bookcase behind you. And uh, unfortunately, my buddy, Nick, who's all also over in the United Kingdom, he was very upset that he wasn't able to see some of the titles of those books that are sitting on the shelf behind you. So he asked me to ask you uh, this question. Do you have like a, a top 10 list or a, uh, a preferred reading list of books that you recommend to people that are coming at these subjects brand new? Uh, I don't have a list per se, but I have asked myself this question before and I have had some friends that aren't as, as far gone as I am in terms of reading. So I have, it depends on the audience, but obviously if you're brand new to this stuff, you don't want to be bogged down into a highly academic type of type of book. So you want something that you can sort of uh, read and, and, and digest uh, quite uh, well, you know, sort of until you get used to the terminology that some of these globalists use, right? Um, but actually, I do. Hang on a second. I've got one here, which I think is quite good. And I'm sure it's been showcased before by many people. Um, I've got Superclass here by David Rothkopf. Uh, that's a good book. Now, yeah, so I think it's a good introduction. Uh, but you do have to be mindful that there are a few... Uh, there's a bit of a gas gaslighting element going on in there as well, um, but, uh, but yeah. So just just be mindful of that, and I would also say just to be mindful as well is as you as you progress through your reading is to be to do your your due, due diligence on the authors before you purchase a book, because some of them can be a lot more tricky. Like if the guy was an ex MI6 or ex CIA guy. You want to be aware of some of the historical contexts and why would he, because don't forget that in terms of national security, whether it's a military guy or whatever, they all have to get their books approved. And so they go through a whole rigorous screening process with regards to information that they can and cannot say. But uh, I would say David Rothkopf is probably an easy an easy one to, to get into the, the matter. Um, just for those who don't know, I mean, David Rothkopf was... Uh, uh, a guy that worked for Henry Kissinger, uh, so yeah. But I think I do suspect him to be a bit deceptive in there. But you know, it's a good entrance. Um, now I found that one which was that took an awful lot of our long time to read because I had loads of notes um, on it, and that is because he's very thorough. And it's a it's an older book. Uh, you know, this was nineteen sixty five. But this was in the English edition, 1965, but it was released in 1963 by a French author called Jacques Ellul, and it's Propaganda, the Formation of Men's Attitudes. Um, now, he also wrote a couple of books on, on the technological society, which was shortly after this one. Uh, so this, again, is back in the early 60s. And this book, why I found it, I mean, it took me an awful lot of an awful long time to digest is because he's really picking apart the the difference between education 
indoctrination and the information that you're receiving, what constitutes propaganda. And he also looks at the psychological effects as to what happens and, and what happens to your brain when you are subjected to propaganda. What are the de desired effects of it by the, the propagandist, you know? And he gives historical examples. He gives, uh, for example, Mao's molding of the, of the mind uh, with regards to the Chinese uh, cultural revolution. Um, he talks about television uh, and you know what it, what propaganda was like before television and what it what it was after, and he it, it's a, it's a so one question which I find quite interesting and we're, I don't know who knows will will we ever be able to find out is um, what are the effects of television on people but television as the the technological tool but as a means. And how can you differentiate the means? Like, so if you're subjected to propaganda via television, how do you know that you are so, that, it, that it's been effective because of television or because of the information itself, the content of the information? So you can't, it's very hard to pick that apart. But it does come to the conclusion that it leads to, uh, so massive psychological campaigns on people does lead to neurosis, depression, anxiety, Etc. Etc. And we are seeing those effects today. So the question then is as well: is uh, what has the effects of social media and the internet and information overload been on people today? So I'll just leave it at that because that's a whole other topic on its own that we probably can talk for hours and hours. Hours, yeah. 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 <laughs> like that's that's probably the subject I can talk for the longest on. Yeah. So this one really sort of. You, you, it took me a long time to get your head around it, but it's it's uh, really valuable because then you do start seeing, you know, just like the, you, you, the, the They Live glasses, as soon as you read that book, you know, you just start seeing everything uh, in a completely different light. And, and you realize the people that have been affected by it as well when you're walking around and you're chatting to people. So, uh, yeah, it, I think it's good to keep a, a strong mind. If you're able to read that, and then you, you get a bit of a stronger mind. Awesome. All, all excellent suggestions, uh, by the way. I, I, have, I have read Superclass. I have not read uh, Jacques Ellul's work yet, but it is on my list and, and has been there for quite a while. Because, of course, uh, I read uh, Edward Bernays' book, Propaganda, I don't know, four or five years ago. Uh, something like that, and was absolutely floored that he was literally just giving everything away in those, what was it, like 130 pages or whatever. He was like, well, if we just put a, a white lab coat on somebody and call them doctor, you know, people will automatically recognize them as an authority figure. Which he again said out loud on mm -hmm. tape on the David Letterman show in the early 1980s, and it still just goes right over people's heads. And people just laughed and clapped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the applause <laughs> sign came on, and they, you know, they did their whole uh, trained seal bit. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's unreal. It's literally unreal. Like, especially when you get to the point where you're not taking everything at face value anymore. You are actually asking yourself questions about the interactions that you have with other human beings to try and figure out, you know, exactly what their motivation is and like where they're coming up with all these crazy things that they're saying that you can't observe from objective reality, but yet they, they're investing a lot of belief into them. Um, you know, it, it's helpful to have, the ideas of others I have found that are also capable of seeing through the illusion, uh, whether, whether or not they're giving you the ultimate answer, I don't think is, is the important part of it. It allows you to view a different perspective that might not have been obvious at first glance. And like you say, hopefully that allows you to start asking some better questions about the world that you exist in. Like, would, would you agree with that? 
hundred percent agree with that, definitely. And I think that's that's the best thing is is to if you do feel that you've got questions inside of you, burning questions, don't suppress them. Go out there and find out. You know, and you might not. You might it might take you years before you get an answer to one of your questions. But you know, just keep at it, and you and you'll get there. And sometimes you, you know, you you'll you'll stumble across the answers by chance as well. You know, but you just got to keep at it and uh, just keep uh, keep an open mind. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you'll even stumble across answers you didn't even know you were looking for. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, AJ, it has been fantastic uh, to have this conversation with you. Uh, no, no. Uh, no less edifying than some of the conversations that we've had uh, in private over Telegram. Uh, I always, uh, I always find something uh, new in your perspective whenever we get a chance to uh, talk about stuff. So I, I certainly thank you for taking the time to uh, to sit down and uh, allow the Liberty Radio audience to listen in on this as well. Um, it's been. Uh, 90 minutes of pure pleasure for me. I hope it has been uh, for you as well. And uh, I'll be glad to have you back on the show uh, anytime you want to come on, especially if you uh, stumble across one of those answers that you think everybody else needs to know about. Definitely uh, reach out and uh, let me know and we'll get you back on. Uh, Let folks know where they can connect with uh, you and your work. Sure. Yeah. So uh, no, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure for me as well being on your show. Actually, an absolute privilege. Uh, I think the Grand Theft World community and Liberty Radio have been uh, doing amazing work. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think more and more people uh, are paying attention now. So uh, yeah, I think it's thanks to you and your community. Uh, but yeah. So with regards to my work, I'm uh, unfortunately I'm only on uh, Telegram for now. Uh, Open Minds Inc. So I and C at the end, and uh, yeah. So I'll, uh, what I do is I usually so w- when I can. I mean, sometimes I'm a, I'm a bit busy, but what I do is I uh, take pictures as well of some of the books that I read, and I post some of the nuggets um, which I find quite interesting or relevant to the to the to the days, I guess, to the times. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I, what I do. And if you ever post a comment in there, I'll always reply. So yeah. awesome. Now it's it's been a while since I've joined the channel, so I don't uh, remember. Is is Open Minds Inc. a public channel on Telegram? Can anybody join, or do they need a link to get in? No, it it is publicly uh, open. So yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know if there's many others, but if you're struggling to find it, the logo is like a neon colored uh, uh, head against the profile of somebody. So, yeah. Yeah, it's the the image that we have in uh, the thumbnail for uh, for today's broadcast and i'll make sure to include the link in uh you know all the uh replays when that gets published and drop it on all the platforms so uh if people have uh any issue finding your channel at all that will take them right to it perfect awesome thank you very much absolutely again thanks for joining us aj and as i said uh anytime you want to come back just uh hit me up in the dms and let me know Perfect. Thank you for the open invitation. It's been a pleasure.